Time wise, there's still a line there, but I think we better get going. First of all, I have an announcement. We're going to have a faculty meeting, a brief one at the end of this uh, seminar today. We are not. I just came from the search committee meeting. They, while there was every indication that there would be a consensus at this point, there is not. And uh, 
So the top two candidates are sort of tied, and one of our search committee members didn't get a chance to meet with one of the candidates. This is important. We can accomplish this through a Skyping. So the search committee decided to do that, and I fully endorse their course of action. So we won't have a meeting today after this. Is that fair, Klaus? Where Hopefully is Klaus? soon, next, uh, early next week. Okay, early next week. All right, so more uh, suspense for us. Today we have the pleasure of Fei Wei, who's, a, who's applying for adjunct status in plant biology. Uh, Fei Wei gave a wonderful talk when he applied for the position at Boyce Thompson. He's settling in now. Let me summarize him. He got a BS in life sciences at National Taiwan University, PhD at Duke, a string of postdocs, Berkeley, Duke, and the University of Zurich. Now he's an assistant professor at Boyce Thompson. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce him with great enthusiasm. Fei Wei. Um, so today I'm really excited to talk about um, the kind of research I've done and the research I'm planning to do in the future. So growing up in Taiwan, I'm really fortunate to be able to go around the islands and collect ferns um, in my teenage years. The diversity of ferns has really amazed me. Um, but by the time I went to grad school, I'm sure of enough of Asian ferns. So I told my advisor, Kevin Pryor, that I want to work on something exotic, exotic ferns, or new topics perhaps. So she gave me this, this fern from Central and South America. And it turned out after a lot of herbarium and molecular work, it turned out to be a new species, a new genus. So we got to name the, the genus, and we decided to name it after Lady Gaga. So the, the, fern is called, the genus is called Gaga. Um, there are several reasons why we did this. For example, Lady Gaga once dressed up like a fern guy. Right? <laughs> 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 GA GA is also a molecular Singapore morphine for the genus. So all the Gaga species have GA GA in this particular cool region, and all other related ferns don't, don't have GA GA. But anyway, I've never imagined that ferns which no one cares about when they make it to a rolling stone. <laughs> <laughs> this is literally Gaga, Lady Gaga's selfie with the Gaga. <laughs> That's quite cool. But the real reason we name it after Lady, Lady Gaga is Lady Gaga has been really um, being all spoken about in the inequality of our society. So, for example, her song, Born This Way, is about in, embracing the individual's um, identity. Andrew Down is about shooting up Trevor Martin. So, Lady Gaga is not, it's not just a random celebrity who sometimes wear really odd dresses. And I couldn't bring, uh, help but bring this up. It's like recently there's an unfortunate mom and I have to talk about it. So look at some of the instruments and also the genital sites. Um, another fun fact about this is this new moth was discovered uh, close to the US Mexican border and the trunks wall would likely drive this species into an extinction. Is this fake news? No, this is true. It was published in Final Zoos or something. <laughs> Zookies. Yeah, that's a good one. This is another new species we discovered. This one from Taiwan. It's Asplenium. It's a really, really unique solar orientation and also spore ornamentations. So we decided to give this species to Ms. Bi Fong Du in Taiwan, who has been done a lot of work uh, in the floristic studies in Taiwan. So in addition to characterize what's the biodiversity out there, I'm also really interested to know what's the, the relationship of among all these ferns, what's their phylogenetic relationship. So a few years ago, my colleague and I did a, a developed a new phylogenetic marker for ferns, and we reconstructed a broad a global fern phylogeny. And I think that the most important contribution from this is we were able to place and include two sort of obscure fern genera from East Asia, Diplosiopsis and Reculosaurus. And internally, they are related to no one, sort of, sort of on its own branch, on their own. So because of this, uh, two new families was circumscribed to, to include these two genera. So Diplosiopsis is now in Diplosiopsis daisy, Reculosaurus is now in Reculosaurus. So I know the flowering plant people, you have APGY, right? But in ferns, we have PPG, a turtle by so that was recently published last year. 
So until recently, all the fur files we constructed were based on cruel class markers. Cruel class marker gives you only a, a biased view of the phylogeny because a single locus is um, maternally inherited. So by working with Carl Raphael's in UC Berkeley, um, we recently did um, a new fur phylogeny based on nuclear markers. And we're excited to find there, we were able to pinpoint some of the earlier divergence of ferns. I'm kind of nervous because Kevin is in the audience. Um, but we have Agnesinum first, um, and then we have Ophir Glossalis as Alphalis next, and then we have Margielis, sister to Leptospirangia ferns. So I hope Kevin will be happy with this. Um, but in addition to ferns, I'm also interested in some other non fern plants. So this is Fulcra, it's a, um, it's a Brassicaceae genus, closely related to Apidopsis. It has a, a lot more species and ecological diversity. So because of this diversity and their close relatedness to our adopters, people have been using Bokra as a model system to study evolutionary genomics. So there has been work done on um, glucosinolate evolutions in Bokra, phytobiome interaction and ecology of Bokra, ecological niche modeling, and also chromosome evolutions. But this is a, this is a huge problem in Bokra. And that problem <laughs> is Bokra are really difficult to identify. So Peter Rawlings once said that Bokra is particularly annoying to the taxonomists. <laughs> and Mike Winter, which is an expert on this genus, asked me that over 50% of the Bokra specimens in the herbaria are misidentified. So the reason that Bokra species are really difficult to identify is that they hybridize like crazy. So this is a, um, a diagram showing the hybrid relationship centered on Bokra parameters. So the orange are the sexual diploids, and whenever they come into contact, they hybridize with each other. And they give rise to apomictic diploids. And this can then sometimes hybridize with yet another sexual diploids. And you have the trigenomic hybrids, triple hybrids. So the end result of this craziness is you have a suite of ecological and morphological intermediates, so it's really difficult to pull them apart. One way to untangle this is you can use uh, co dominant markers like microsatellites. So here's an example here's the Boca de Giansis. It has uh, alleles coming from. Bokra thompsoni, and this coming from Formosa. So this is likely a hybrid between these two species. So for the past six to seven years, we have been genotyping Bokra specimens um, using microsatellite loci. So now we have almost 4,500 specimens genotyped with 15 loci. And we include over 100 nomenclature types, and we include all about one NAMP species. You know, microsatellite is not a fancy technology these days, but it's really cheap. And it's really fast. You can get results looking at day or two. <laughs> and importantly, because uh, microsatellites are really short fragments, so it, it works really well with the old herbarium specimens. And my personal record is this specimens collected by Serrano Watson. So Watson was an uh, assistant to Asa Gray at Harvard. And in 1867, he embarked a, a six year expedition to the western uh, United States. And in August, collected this particular plant. And 150 years later, I was able to grant out the tissues and got DNA and a genotype of 15 loci. sites. And I was using our poor Jeff's famous C-type procedures. Um, so this is very cool. Um, but with all this data, um, I also generated a book on Microsoft website, or <laughs> to, to host this um, all this data. So we can search can download the data and we are in the process of linking herbarium images to this as well. And I also developed a, a, an algorithm that I use microsatellites <coughs> to identify species. So I call this Tyson inquiry based on some larger multi alleles or Tesla. Um, so the, the way Tyson works is you, you input a multi locus genotypes and we're going to BMW to search uh, for, the, for the species identity. Another program I've developed is called Parental Relationship Identification Using Software, <laughs> or Prius. So then this is used to identify a hybrid. So if you have a hybrid genotype, you all use Tesla and VMW to find the parents that give rise to a hybrid. Prius hybrids, you know. So I don't have time to go into details, but the paper is coming out in the database. Um, so, but after looking at ferns for many, many years, I began to wonder 
but make a firm, a firm, right? So I figure maybe I can find some some answer by looking into their genes. So perhaps the, the defining all the common features of ferns is their great loving and habitat. And perhaps their low line adaptation has something to do with their photoreceptor inclusion. And with this audience, I think I don't need to convince you that light is really important for plants because it's needed for photosynthesis and so on. <coughs> so plants have a really sophisticated way to find light uh, to optimize their photosynthesis. So they bend their shoots and they move their chloroplast. And you can actually manipulate light to print a, uh, a fern from a fern. So this is aggregation <laughs> of chloroplast. <laughs> this is a quick movie I took under a focal microscope. So I flash a strip of blue laser here, and you can see um, the chloroplast wiggle, and then they move toward that blue light. So at the interface between lights and the uh, physiological, physiolo physiological responses are the photoreceptors. So it sends the light directions, spectrum, intensity, and it elicit the proper responses. So at uh, Dobsis, we have a uh, photo being encrypted from that sense of blue light, and we have fire from that sense of red and far light. So we know ferns have a really long evolutionary history, but the recent the majority of the ferns we see today, they resulted from a rather recent radiation after the rise of angiosperms. So we say ferns uh, diversify in the shadow of angiosperms. And it turned out that ferns have a really unique photoreceptor thing. So this is a neocomb, it's a chimeric photoreceptor that combining part phototropin and part phyto. <laughs> so this is how neocomb looks like in, in terms of the structures. It has the N terminus coming from phytocombs the right light sensing module, and at the C terminus, it has a blue light sensing module and a signal <laughs> output domain from phototropin. So this is how neocomb look like in terms of gene structure. It's important to know that there's no intron in neocombs, but you have a lot of introns in phototropin. So this suggests that the origins of this chimeric photoreceptor might involve some retrotransposition. Another cool thing about <coughs> neocomb is that it, is, it was they appear to be unique to ferns. So in most plants, you don't have neocombs, and they use blue light. They can only use phototropin and sense blue light to control their phototropic responses. <laughs> but in ferns, because they have this chimeric photoreceptor, they can use both red and blue light to to elicit their phototropic responses. <laughs> and it has been hypothesized that maybe neocomb is a key innovation that drives the recent radiations of ferns. And if you mutate neocombs in ferns, the, um, the light sensitivity to light is great to reduce. So again, suggesting the importance of neocomb in ferns. And there's an interesting twist in this. A similar chimeric photoreceptor was found in algae, and totally unrelated to ferns. So in this algal neocomb, like the fern neocomb, it has a, um, a right light sensing module from phytochrome, and also a blue light sensing from phototropin. But well, the important difference is uh, the algae neocomb has a lot of <coughs> introns, while the fern neocomb has no intron at all. So because this difference in gene structures, and also a distant relationship between ferns and the zygmatalian algae, it's hypothesized that neocomb has two separate origins um, in the evolution of algae and plants. So, so far we know neocomb is part phytochrome and part phototropin, and this chimeras and allow them to use both red blue light and far light to, to regulate phototropic responses. And perhaps play an important role for ferns adaptation to a low light environment. But we don't really know is neocomb really absent in other plant lineages. So there hasn't been any comprehensive survey of neocomb across all plant tree of life. <coughs> and we also don't know which phytochrome and which phototropin <coughs> gives rise to neocombs and why exactly that happened. So to answer these questions, I need to survey um, all photosynthetic photosynthetic carriers and look into their what kind of photoreceptors they have. So I was quite fortunate to be involved in the 1,000 plant projects, which has been sequencing transcriptomes for over a thousand plant, um, from algae all the way to flowering plants. So here are some numbers. I have transcriptomes uh, and genomes data from um, all major lineage of plant plants. So we have plant plants here, clarified algae, which is a clarophyletic grade lineage of plant plants and also a chlorophyte algae. So, as I mentioned before, neocomb was found only in ferns and in, in the algae. 
So I now wrote a simple bioinformatic pipeline to search all this genome data and to look for the followers averages. But one night my computer was you know, running the, my scripts and it suddenly started to shout out, homeward, homeward. And I was like, what is homeward? <laughs> um, so homeward is one of the verified lineages uh, together with mosses and liverworts. It's only around 200 species worldwide. And with the help of the homeward expert, and there's only one homeward expert on this planet, it turned out, I was able to obtain <laughs> Yukon homologs in four out of the five orders of homeward. <coughs> but I couldn't find neocombs in any other uh, plant lineages, only the ferns and homewards. So how do you explain this disjunct distributions of neocombs? Well, there could be one hypothesis that maybe there's an ancient origins of neocombs <coughs> followed by multiple losses. Or there could be yet another independent origins of neocombs in homewards. Or there could be horizontal transfer between homewards and ferns. So to distinguish among these three hypotheses, I need to place neocombs onto a broader phylogenetic context um, of phytochrome and phylogeny. So I basically align all neocomb sequences <coughs> in phytochromes in their phytochrome um, sensor module and also all the phylogeny into the neocombs phylogeny part and, gener and generated a phylogeny tree. I'm going to show the result from this part. So there are two important relationships I want to draw your attention to. So first, all the neocomb sequences, they fall into two plates. <laughs> so one include the algae neocombs, and the other one include the first plus homeward neocombs. So this confirmed an earlier hypothesis, there are two separate origins of neocombs, one in algae and one somewhere in ferns and homewards. So I'm going to zoom into this part. So what is really cool is that all the fern neocomb sequences, you can see here, are nested within the homeward neocomb sequences. So this nested relationship suggests there's a horizontal gene transfer event from homewards to ferns. Right? And all these homeward sequences are in turn nested or sister related to homeward phototropins. So another interesting thing I found is the homeward phototropin has no intro. But remember, most of the phototropin has a lot of introns. So maybe there's a virtual <coughs> transition that got like rid of all the introns that gave rise to homeward phototropin. And in whole words, if used within, with, with another phytochrome, it would become neocomb. And this was that horizontally transferred to ferns. So the punchline now is that ferns acquire neocomb through horizontal gene transfer and that make ferns great again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, this was one of the first horizontal gene transfer um, discovery with, uh, with, within plants. And as I'm publication some GMO, so Oh, um, Carl Zimmer wrote an article about this. It's called Plants That Practice Genetic Engineering. In addition to neocomb, I also look into the parental genes, um, the phytochromes and phototropins. I didn't have time to go into details, but you can see the publication there. Right. So in addition to their shape loving habits, um, ferns are also notable for their insect resistance. So over a hundred years ago, Charles Bruce noted that ferns <laughs> there's usually no insects that feed on ferns. So they are really immune to all the uh, plant uh, insect herbivores. And Hendrix, 60, 60 years later, they, he did a more quantitative study to compare insect <coughs> herbivores in ferns and also in, in Andrew's ferns. So what he find is there's a, so y axis here, the factory. So y axis here is the, um, the number of herbivores species that feed either on plants or on flowering plants, scaled by the number of species, of course. And he concluded that there's a 25 difference between herbivory on ferns and on flowering plants. So this difference is quite striking, but for years it has been unclear why ferns, uh, why insects tend to avoid ferns. So I was quite excited that a few months ago I saw this paper published in Nature Biotechnology. So they isolated a, a fern proteins or fern, of course, and when they engineer the gene into cotton, the cotton can, can fight themselves against white flies, which is a really major pest and hard to control. So this fern insectile protein was isolated from the fern cotactaria, and the majority of this protein is consists of a chitin, chitin binding domain. So I'm really curious about where, where this gene comes from. So, but interesting, I only, only find these genes 
in some firm genomes and transcriptomes that we are working on, but not in order to sequence plant genomes, only in ferns. <laughs> so then make a phylogeny of this PFAN family, and you can see the fern secretions are right there. And I'm going to zoom into that part. So th that this is that part blown up. So you can see all the fern secretions are here and sister to a particular bacteria sequence. And all that is in turn nested away from the bacteria sequences. So this, again, nasty relationships may suggest two things. Well, first, maybe this in insect cytoprotein is not produced by ferns, maybe produced by a bacteria that living inside the fern, an endophyte, maybe. Or there could be another horizontal transfer event from a bacteria to ferns. So to untangle, to, to, to tell this two hypotheses apart, I look into the, the fern genomes that we are working on. So I'll talk more about the fern genomes later. But in our fern genome, this inside resistant gene is right here. We are in a part of the scaffolds. And all upstream and downstream genes are really good plant genes. And you don't see any abnormality about weak mapping um, here. So this suggests this, this inside resistant genes is inside the fern genome. And this gene is being expressed in transcriptomes as well. In different tissues, and you actually express more in the, in the submerged tissues of cell brain. And also, you can notice that in this gene model, there's an intron here, so it can suggest this is not a bacteria gene, but very likely a, a, a plant gene. So, again, um, the reason that fern is resistant to, to insects is maybe because they <laughs> horizontally acquire uh, uh, insect resistant gene from bacteria. So, ferns. Adaptation to lower environments they, because they probably got a, a, a new kind of foliar separate gene from homewards and they're resistant to insects, is they got a chitin binding proteins from bacteria. So maybe there's a better way to sum this up is and with HGG. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, as I alluded earlier, that I'm also um, sequencing some fern genomes. Um, so, I think I want to. Talk about what we have on Earth um, for our fern genes. So in this genomic age, there are all sorts of genomes being sequenced, but not a fern, which is quite sad because fern is sister to, to sequence. So if you want to understand the origin of flowers, the origin of seeds, you need to understand ferns as well. But the reasons that fern genomics are lagging behind is they have a lot of chromosomes. I mean a lot. And this is a chromosome squad from off your glasses. Anyone want to guess how many chromosomes he has? He has over 1,400 chromosomes. <laughs> so that's a lot. And the genome, the fern genomes are big as well. So the average C value of fern genome is 14 gigabases. So here's a, a fern cell rotum. The genome size is 70 gigabases. The fern average is here, tomatoes here. You don't see our adopters on here because it's really small. But like biology, there's always an exception, right? So that exception is this bizarre-looking fern called Azola. And Azola has a small genome. The genome size is only 0.75 gigabases. <coughs> right, so right between our dobsis and tomato, and the fern average is right here. And I guess most importantly, Azola has some really amazing biology. And that the first amazing biology of Azola started around 50 million years ago, um, when the Earth was a much warmer place. And the Arctic was actually a big freshwater lake. So Azula bloomed at the time, and it's estimated that Azula covered over uh, 4 million square kilometers. And, at, and in a 1 million time interval, they um, sequestered over 10 trillion tons of carbon dioxide and sink into the bottom of the ocean with it. So people have hypothesized that Azula may have facilitated the Earth transition from that warmer climate to a now cooler environment. In addition, um, in Azula, which means tiny leaf, they have this um, symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria. So the cyanobacteria will fix nitrogen for the plants. Plants will provide sugars and the shelter in return, so it's a symbiotic relationship. And in fact, without knowing this symbiotic relationship, Chinese has been using Azula together to grow rice as their uh, biofertilizers. So actually, in Erie, uh, you, there's an Azula germplasm because Azula is important for rice farming. So in Azula is perfect um, to be the ferns that 
to, to, to be the first one that, that has a genome sequence. And then we also feel that Azola has some characteristics that the general public can relate to. So in 2014, um, we started a crowdfunding experiment um, to, to, to get support from the general public. Um, crowdfunding, your research project was quite new at the time, but after a lot of tutoring, tweeting and read, social networking, we finally got some traction. And the economist actually wrote an article about it, it's called um, Azula Aquatic Alfalfa. Although I really don't like the photo they put up here, what is that toad doing over there? It's <laughs> going the spotlight. <laughs> but after several months, we, we, we got uh, over 100 backers, and we also got BGI um, in China got on board to provide um, the sequence we need. Um, <coughs> So it grew up to a to much larger international collaborations, and it has been a lot of fun working with all these collaborators. But having a genome is nice, you know, but it will be even more awesome if we can have the non French genomes that we can compare them with. So I went back to a French tree of life and I had to look for another candidate for genome sequencing. So I focused on solving Aries right here. Include some of the really bizarre looking ferns, so I saw on the top. Because Salvini Aries has two families, Asiliaceus and Salviniaceus. And I should note that only Azola has a symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria. So the first thing we did is we, we want to know the genome size of all this. So we know Azola has a small genome size, but how about the others? And it turned out they all have pretty small genome sizes. So remember the, the fern average is 14 gigabases, and they all have less than 2 gigabases. So really reduced genome size. What really stu stood out is Salvinia, which is only 0.525 gigabases. That's really small because, you know, to put this in, into perspective, our doctors here in Kuchin know for gen small genomes and Salvinia and so on. And the phone average is way off the chart. So we feel, okay, then let's sequence Salvinia as well. And importantly, <laughs> Salvinia also have really amazing biology too. So Salvinia so molasta is recognized as one of the worst um, invasive species of all time. It has caused serious problems in Australia, Africa, and also in South sovereign United States. And also, uh, uh, Salvina has no roots, so this blue like thing dangling here is actually a honey modified leaf, so I'm very interested. So I'm really curious about what's the genetic program or the molecular program that can convert the leaf to look like a root so it can function like a leaf. So I'm not, I'm not so sure if you're familiar with this comedy show called Between Two Birds. <laughs> so Azola on the Obama side um, has symbiosis with cyanobacteria and has roots. So being on the other side, side has no symbiosis and has no roots. So I feel like comparing these two genomes would be quite exciting. So we went ahead and de novo sequence two reference genomes. Um, I don't want to go into the details here, but I would say the sample is looking pretty good. And then we're finalizing a lot of uh, analysis right now. So today I'm just going to um, share two stories, um, one on whole genome notifications and ferns, and another one on um, Zola and bacteria symbols. <coughs> so for genomic studies done on flowering plants, we know the evolution of plant, plant um, the evolution of flowering plants is full of whole genome duplications. And whole genome duplications is important for plant evolution because they created extra genetic materials that interest selection can act on. So with the two foreign genome sequence, we're really curious about what's the pattern of whole genome duplication in first, because it was completely unknown before. And D, we found there's a clear intragenomic synteny in Azola, but we don't find this synteny in itself in the sister foreign genomes. So this suggests that maybe there's a um, Azola-specific whole genome duplication. And we do find some two-to-one synthetic blocks. So here's a Salvinia. <coughs> Uh, scaffolds and correspond to two Azola scaffolds. When I use the uh, phylogeny to, to confirm this, so the y axis here is the number of the percentage of genes that are duplicated. And you can see there's a peak in Azola. And interesting, we also find another peak that is older, predating um, the divergence of Salvin Aries and Polypoly Aries. And we have evidence also suggest supporting this. Uh, from synteny, so we do have some synthetic blocks that are 2 to 2 correspondence, so 2 Azola blocks and 2 Salvinia blocks. Furthermore, um, 
But we plotted the case of versions between the synthetic genes, and we can find out two peaks, you know, Zola, but one peak in Salvinia. And the common peak here was coming from the older progenome duplication events. And this younger peaks is the Zola specific progenome duplication events. And this makes sense when we look at the uh, chromosome number and genome size. So Zola has probably more chromosomes and also larger genomes. But what's the general pattern of firm whole genome duplications? So to answer that, we need more genomes. Um, so right, right now, the two reference genomes we have are both coming from Salvin ACs. So we are in the process of sequencing Kulavaria, which is the uh, um, family sisters to Salvin ACs. And we're also working out at the Antum genome, and as well as the uh, Dipters genome. Right, so hopefully with all these genomes done, we can have a better pictures about firm genome mutations in general. Right, so that, now I'm going to switch the gear a little bit and talk about Zola standard vector symbolysis. So, in addition to um, generating one reference genome for Zola, we also did um, low coverage genome se resequencing on several other Zola species as well, trying to cover its phylogenetic depth. Well, one cool thing you can do with this is you can look at the whole and symbiome code evolution. So, and with all this resequencing data, we can extract the standard vector reads out and then assemble the standard vector genome and make a phylogeny tree. So my profile here in quotation marks means that's a standard vector genome from a zoomic profile. And that standard vector phylogeny almost corresponds 100% to the plant phylogeny. So there's a co-phylogenetic relationship. And this sort of suggests that perhaps a, a, the standard vector is on, on its way becoming a sort of an organelle dedicated to nitrogen fixation. With the genome annotation done, we can also look into a genetic component that might be important for Zola and standard vector symbolics. So previous studies have uh, shown that plants use a common symbiosis pathway to regulate the Zobian symbiosis and also mycorrhiza symbiosis. So my question is, is it possible that standard vector Zola also co-opted this common symbiosis pathway for standard vector symbiosis? So I look into a, a lot of these common symbiosis genes in, in our genomes and realize they're not clear. Although I can find the awful lot in all the ferns, but just not in Azola and Salvinia. So this suggests that there's no way that Azola used the common symbiosis <laughs> pathway for cyanobacter symbiosis because the genes are just simply not there. Right? So to get an idea about the genes that are involved within this data experiments, um, the nice thing about Azola is you can remove the cyanobacteria by dosing them with antibiotics. So we can have cyano minus strains and cyano plus strains, and we can grow them in different nitrogen contents and do transcriptomes um, to see what's our genes, what's our gene differential express. This is what happens when you have miscommunication with sequencing centers. So we made the library a while ago, but it has not been sequenced. So hopefully we can get our data back soon. Right. So in the final part, I want to just talk about um, what I plan to do in the future, and that's my newfound love, homework. <laughs> so, horns are remarkable creatures, um, but not many people study them. Horns, like, like I said before, is a group of bryophytes together with leaveworts and mosses. The relationship between among homeworks, leaveworts, and mosses and vesicular plants has been unknown um, as a contentious. So people have been thinking maybe there's a all brown finds a monophyletic group sensitive to vascular plants. Or some people say thinks the whole world is the first branch of plant plants, and then you have moss, leaver works, and vascular plant on the other side. And there's another camp thinks whole <coughs> is the most sister to vascular plants. But regardless of this whole world's positions in the plant tree of life, horns are just really, really cool. So horns have really unique Photosynthesis and nitrogen fixations. Um, so for carbon fixations, they have pyranoid base carbon concentrated mechanisms. So some holes have only one gigantic chloroplast, <coughs> and they aggregate their rubisco in that pyranoid. And they pump all the carbon dioxide into that uh, aggregation of rubiscos so that they can increase their photosynthetic efficiency. So this is different from C4 and CAM, which use biochemical way. 
we use this biophysical way to concentrate CO2. And for nitrogen fixation, we have standard vector acidosis, like Azoa. So here is the, the standard vector colonies. They are hosted inside of cohort phallus. So cohort paranoids is interesting because there are, you can find several species periods that one has paranoids and the other doesn't have paranoids. And if they don't have paranoids, they have multiple chloroplast um, per cell. In fact, paranoid has been lost in GAN multiple times in homeless evolutions. So this evolutionary framework really allows you to, com to use comparative genomics to, to understand what does it take to make a paranoid and what does it take to make a, a common concentrated mechanism in homeless. And it may have something uh, may have some important implication to photosynthesis. <laughs> and for cyanobacteria, um, all the homework all, all the homeworks have cyanobacteria symbiosis. And Jack Meeks in UC Davis is perhaps the, the only person that studied this. And he, he developed a system that can grow homeworks and cyanobacteria separately. And you can mix them together to re-establish the symbiosis in vitro. So we can study the process this way. But he confessed with me once that he never he has never cared about homewards. He just used homewards as the uh, environments to study his cyanobacteria. <laughs> so although he identifies several uh, cyanobacteria genes that are important for symbiosis, we know nothing about the homeward uh, genetic regulation. I think cyanobacteria are really important because it will be great if we can engineer some plants that can form symbiosis with um, some crops can form symbiosis with nitrogen fixing microbes. The rhizobium system has some limitations because they are autotrophic, uh, they are heterotrophic, so plants have to provide the food and do so in a balanced way. But cyanobacteria they are autotrophic, and they, they are studies showing that they still retain some photosynthetic activity even in, in the symbiotic state. Now, nitrogenates are, are sensitive to uh, oxygen. So the plants have to provide, to provide, to provide an, an oxygen environment. But for cyanobacteria, they have this um, heterosis. They have elaborate cell walls that can block all of the oxygen. So maybe cyanobacteria are less reliant on the host and it could be easier to transfer that to the crop plants. So I hope I convinced you that homewards are really cool, uh, particularly uh, about the nitrogen and carbon fixing uh, mechanisms. So Peter Savani, um, University of Zurich, recently did a groundwork um, on establishing um, and phosphorus agrastis as a model species to study whole biology. So I spent before I come here, I spent several months in Zurich, which is awesome, um, to study whole biology. Um, so my, my goal there was try to figure out a CRISPR-Cas protocol to work on whole So CRISPR-Cas Cas has been working on Macantia, the liverworts, and physical mature the, the mosses. Really well. So the same principle should also apply to homeworks. So now I can generate protoplasts quite easily, and now I'm going to try doing um, transient transformations and to, to put in the, the CRISPR Cas compound. <coughs> right, so hopefully today I give you some sort of an idea of what kind of research I've done and what kind of research I'm planning to do. Uh, I've done a lot of basic taxon taxonomy work on ferns and bokra on the, the Brassicaceae plants. We develop new methods to, to study their phylogenetic relationship and look into the genes and genomes of ferns and also moving towards forwards. So with that, um, thank you. So yeah, um, we don't know. We, we know they are not they are not stuck inside. Okay, so could that have been a possible mechanism for horizontal gene transfer? So if nostoc is like a vector from homeworks to ferns. And then the second question is, has there been any evidence that there is actual nitrogen transfer from the cyanobacteria and homeworks to the hornwork? Because I feel like I've read some old literature that's like. Matter. <laughs> yeah, they, so the second question is, yeah, there are uh, evidence suggesting that uh, nitrogen transfer. Okay. Um, you can grow homeworks and cyanobacteria. If they have symbiosis, you can grow them without um, 
you going to have any nitrogens on at all? Um, well, the first question is, so I don't think so, because the the symbiosis, the firm cyanobacterial symbiosis is only limited to one particular genus. And it's hard to believe that they transfer just to that genus and then to other firms. So I don't think that's the, 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 the connection. So you, you mentioned a, a case of a horizontal gene transfer from bacteria to gene that apparently acquired an intro. Yes. And so I wonder, do you know what's in the intron? Like, I'm specifically wondering if there is a transposal in there. I haven't looked into that. Um, yeah, that's a great thing. I, I need to look into that. So there are some animal, some insect studies that they find some bacteria to insect um, transfer, horizontal transfer, and sometimes they acquire intron afterwards. But I, I don't know the case of uh, in a firm. Cyanobacterial symbiosis occurs in cycads and in, in gunnera in the sequence. And gunera, yeah. Right, but so why only there? But such a, if it were such a good system, why hasn't it occurred somewhere else? That's a great question. So I don't. I don't know. know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's, yeah. So so those symbioses are endosymbioses. So they have structure to hold cyanobacteria. But there are other plants that they they can have cyanobacteria on their surface, so, so, so sort of epiphytic symbiosis, and that's more common. So a lot of mosses have epiphytic symbiotic cyanobacteria, and some some other land plants they also have uh, cyanobacteria aggregated around their rhizosphere. So perhaps the endosymbiotic relationship only evolve in certain places, but in general, maybe it's more common. Yeah, I don't know that. That's my speculation. <laughs> when you showed us that example of the insect resistance gene, can yes. you tell me how generic is the resistance? Because I would have expected one bacterial gene to be fairly specific in terms of the insects that it provided resistance to, but it sounds like the ferns are generically resistant to insects. That's right. Um, so there must be either many other genes, or tell me a little bit more about that gene. So that so they only test that in, in uh, against white flies. Yeah. So we don't know if that's a g generic thing or not. Mm -hmm. But I, I agree there must be a suite of chemicals and proteins that for the defense, and that's maybe just one particular example. That's that's the way. Yeah. And also, how what's the estimated gene number that you have for um, in the Yeah, generically. I mean, is there a is there a Set of genes that how many are in ferns? In ferns. So, um, for Azola, we have, by annotation so far, we have around 24,000 gene models, and for Salvinia, we have a little bit less than 20,000 gene models. Um, so, we are working on gene family classification right now to look at what genes are specific, specific to ferns and what genes are specific to sea plants. And we got the data. Quite recently, I haven't had a chance to summarize that. But that's but smaller than most plants in terms of genome. Yeah, somehow smaller. Even though genome size tends to be much bigger. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you listed some of the um, some of the genomes that you guys are working on to get a broader picture of ferntology. What about? I didn't see Ceratopsis up there. Are those, is that going to be? I don't know. Right. So yeah. So I talked so. Um, some of this group they are working on Ceratopsis genomes, and the problem with Ceratopsis genomes is they are really, really big. It's 12 gigabases, and this, you, you, don't, you cannot really go anywhere with <laughs> 12 gigabases. <laughs> yeah. um, they have a sample now, um, it's not very great. But, so we are talking about maybe we can combine our genome data to, to publish together, and that, that will make better news. Right. So ferns don't have like rhizobial relationships, right? It's only cyanobacterial. Right. So, so that's so in Azola, so they have a, a leaf pocket that they host the cyanobacteria inside. 
And then we grow, we, we try to grow this in a Zen environment. And I want to see what, what else are in that pocket. So we do a minor genomic sequencing on that. And we got a lot of Rhizobium sequences back. So we have to figure out what's happening there. Is it contamination or there are really Rhizobium in the leaf pocket? Yes. I mean, is that established? Are there Rhizobia in other ferns? I was wondering if that. No, no, that's the only thing that we can find. I was wondering if that, that gene that seems to be imparting the insect is it's, it's flying tightly, right? So yes. Could that, the presence of that be precluding the establishment of any Rhizobial relationship to make it necessary to examine it? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> But so we are work, well looking into that Rhizobia in the Azula leaf pockets, um, hoping to do some fish to, to really show that they are inside <coughs> that pockets and do something. Um, yeah. So this is not a question, but more of a comment. So we follow up on the previous question. So um, just so that you make me know that maybe something was something you mentioned. So firms are really known to accumulate uh, lots of toxic metals. Yes, okay. they do. So maybe this is some of the you know traditional you know insecticides function. You know, that could it, yeah. Maybe something was different. Yeah, there's a fern species called Turris vitata that can accumulate arsenic. Like arsenic. Just salt and chemical. Right, ten percent of the dry weights right. could be arsenic. Awesome. Well, so that could be one of the you know. Right, and that fern has like, like almost no insect damage. <laughs> 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 Uh, you talked about the, the neochrome and hypothesizing that it may have contributed to some of the fern diversity since the yes. When you track where this neochrome is in the fern phylogeny, is it like in, in mainly the, you know, or is it in all the different unions or only like the colorful babies? Mm -hmm. Right, so, so there were some studies <coughs> that trying to, to look into the distributions of neochrome ferns. It was believed that neochromes only restricted to polypop ferns, which yeah. diversify in the, in the low-lying environment. Yeah. But I was able to find some neochromes in other ferns as well. So that correlation is not that strong. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Oops. It, it was interesting that you showed that the neochromes with no introns with like a lot of introns. Do you find intermediates that would suggest that the, all those introns I mean, it, it seems unusual that you would have either gained or lost all of them at the same time. I, no, I don't find any intermediates. But if you, if you transcribe into MRI and then somehow got reinserted into the genomes, then you will lose all the intron at once. Right. I see. Okay. Okay. So that's your so that's your right. Okay, with that, please join me in thanking Fei Wei for a...